we spend years trying to put the pieces together of what happened to us because no one will believe us <laughs> that it's as bad as we say so we're like but here's the puzzle let me show you with my spreadsheet my excel spreadsheet what happened to me and they're still like but did he hit you though i mean because if he hasn't hit you then it's probably not so bad okay and you're like Good YouTube fam, it's your girl Grace Sandra. So I am back for a follow-up to how my life has been a year after struggling with all of the follow of being in a very severely narcissistically abusive marriage with a very severe verbal abuser. If you want to know what happened, like really the nitty gritty of what happened, you might want to start there. And if that's the case, I'll see you next week. For those of you who already know the story and you just want to see what has happened in the last year, how have you been girl? Like, are you surviving? Did you get through? Like, I know you had a new boyfriend for a little while what happened with that and what happened i know you're still co-parenting like what's the situation i just thought it might be cool to do a year update also if you haven't yet go ahead and give me a subscribe please like the video it helps me do this and reach more women and that's really if you don't know me personally that is the deepest deepest desire of my heart is to help black women who have been through any sort of narcissistic abuse and who are just really reeling from trauma bonds complex ptsd anxiety depression and all of the like with that let's get started so the quick recap I left off on the last video where my ex had hovered me really bad right around this time last year as a matter of fact just the other day two days ago in my memories came up one of the times where a trick that he used to hover me and control me emotionally was to tell me that he was leaving to move to another state that he was gonna leave me and my daughter behind just forget just forget the whole thing he had been hovering me for about a month he had been crying crocodile tears I had only ever seen him cry hard one time in six years and I saw him cry very very hard for an entire month begging me telling me i was the only woman he ever loved that he just loved me so much that he just couldn't live another day without me at that point we had been divorced just for a few months finalized in june 2020 we separated meaning he moved out august 29th he immediately discarded and replaced me my trauma bonds were so deep that i immediately went into a very severe depressive episode in which i was literally begging when i say begging i mean on my hands and knees crying begging him to have mercy on me to stop being with the other woman to stop lying to me to keep his commitments <laughs> he didn't by january of 2020 i was out completely done out of it couldn't work couldn't sleep couldn't eat couldn't think i was very suicidal and he was sleeping with us both and i had to basically go into emergency therapy sessions twice a week this was pre-quarantine and then i started emdr therapy i also have a six or seven part series on emdr therapy i went through a very intense 12 to 16 sessions i can't remember how many sessions i had if i hadn't had those emdr therapy sessions i I do think I may have killed myself. I was teetering on the bitter edge. For those of you who've been through narcissistic abuse, if you know, you know. It gets to that point, you just, the devaluation is so thorough, you feel like there's nothing else worth living. So anyway, that's the timeline. He started the hovering process right around this time last year, about a month ago last year. He knew I was in a very happy relationship by that point. Right before quarantine started, I met my partner and because of quarantine, we spent a lot of time together. I was out of work, he wasn't working. I mean, not out of work, like we didn't have to physically go into work. So we just spent a lot of time eating really good food, talking, laughing, watching movies, dating. Like we just like quarantine, rushed our relationship. So we were in a full, full on committed relationship by, you know, June, 2020. My ex knew that he hovered me anyway. I wish I could tell y'all that I was not tempted because honestly, it doesn't matter if there's another person or not. If you're still trauma bonded, you're trauma bonded. So I was tempted. I was very, very, very tempted. And I was really sad because I was like, now you're offering me all these things I wanted when we were married. Telling me I'm beautiful, telling me I'm the best woman he's ever had and will ever have he gave me an ultimatum again right around this time last year probably like this day last year to be honest i should probably look it up and he was like you know you gotta tell me it's it's me or him so i was like okay it's him it's him i can't go back to you unless you show me that you've changed i said this to him though i said if you can show me a year from now i was like in august september of 2021 which is right now i was like if you could show me that you've changed and you're working you're com really committed to working on your verbal abuse because he told me he was committed to it he wrote me a whole list these are the 15 verbally abuse 
abusive behaviors I'm working on, I'm really gonna commit to working on not being a covert malignant narcissist. He saw my videos, he knew that I was talking about him and what had happened. He's like, I'm really gonna be working on it. So I was like, okay, in about a year, like if my partner and I aren't together, then yeah, I'll reconsider. And honestly, y'all, that might not have been super honest. I don't know if I was re if I was ready to reconsider, but I didn't want to let go because I very much loved him and I'm sorry. <laughs> That's just how it goes when you're trauma bonded. You still feel very much in love with the person that you're trauma bonded to. So he told me when I chose not to have him, when I was like, I'm choosing my partner, he was like, okay, fuck this. I'm about to go on dating apps. I'm just about to start dating everybody because I can't handle being in this kind of pain, like loving you this much and not having you want me back. Which is honestly what he put me through for our entire marriage. So I was like, do you boo, like do what you need to do. So he gets on dating apps. He told me he dated, he went on 10 dates in a week's time and he meets this woman he really likes. And so he told me he met her. He told me on a Saturday that he still love me so much. Just, I love you so much. Just, just remember that I, I will always love you. You're the one woman that I want. Okay, so he meets this woman on Monday. <laughs> they went on a date on Monday. On Friday night, he texts me and says, Me and her are in a relationship. It was like, <laughs> What the f so I'm like, you're in a relationship? I was like stuttering, like what the hell? So him and her decide to commit to each other. That's a Friday, okay. Now we talking about one week's time. So then on a Saturday, I saw him when we were doing our drop off pickup with our daughter. And I was like, so you love her now? And he was like, yeah, he started crying. He was like, it's really deep, like it's really deep. I just love her so much. I was like, you just told me a week ago you love me. And I was like, so you don't love me no more? He was like, no, I love her. Yeah, I wish I could tell you that it was funny to me. It wasn't. It was not funny to me. I was really hurt. I felt discarded again. I was like, you just made me believe you loved me again. And even though I wasn't choosing you, there was some comfort. Or let me try to explain. There was comfort in him telling me like, yeah, I did love you. Yes, you are attractive. Yes, I, I, I realized I made all these mistakes with you. There was comfort in that because it was like, oh, okay, at least it gave me some closure. Like even if I don't want him anymore, I feel like, oh, he did really love me. He did really find me attractive. He did really want to have sex with me he actually did want to stay married to me but he knew that he couldn't because he had too many issues to work on so there was a weird level of comfort so when he told me that he loved me on one saturday and then the next saturday that he don't love me no more now he's in love with her i was like oh all that wasn't true i just got hovered i just got tricked again by a covert malignant narcissist who's a pathological liar which is what i've been experiencing our whole marriage it was kind of a letdown for me as a person who thought I had got past that. I thought I was through trauma bonding. I thought I was over the pain of him being able to emotionally disintegrate my feelings and my heart. And it hurt. It really hurt. And it was sad for my partner too because he didn't understand why I was hurt. Like, well, if you don't want him anymore, if you don't love him anymore, if you love me, why are you so sad about this? And it was very difficult to explain. Like, it's not really about you. It's really about this unhealed part of me that I'm still really dealing with. And I'm, I'm so sorry that I'm here, but this is just where I'm at so it was it was sad it was really sad I told him a couple weeks later that I wanted him back I was like okay I do want you back and he was like you just want me back now because you see I'm happy with somebody else which I would like for y'all to hear the irony in that really it wasn't that I didn't want him back I wanted to test him I wanted to know like did you really mean any of that stuff he just told me no I'm sorry I love her now I'm with her now she's gonna be in my life for a very long time you need to deal with it I screamed at him in expletive. This was a very intense conversation that I'm making sound like it was like so nice and kind and it was an extremely tense conversation. He went on to express his deep love for her. They are actually surprisingly still together. <laughs> I did not think it was gonna last this long, but they are still together. I don't know if they're happy or not. And that's not my business. That is not my business. All I'll say is they are still together. I don't really wanna focus on him and the fact that he's still with her. What I wanna explain is how this journey has been for me. A year post hover. Once he decided to go full force in with this woman, he didn't like flaunt it all over the internet, but he did the, you know, like the I'm in a relationship thing. There was a lot of little things that he was doing on the internet that was very subtle, but definitely letting people know, like, I have this new woman in my life. I'm so in love with her. Blase splee. It was hurtful for me only in that I was looking. It was hurtful. It was sad. I was stalking him still, though not to the extent <laughs> that I stalked him when we were married, not to the extent that I stalked him when we were post-divorce. I was still interested in knowing what is he saying? What is he saying about her? How does it differ from where we were when we were first in our relationship? And I wanted to point out to y'all because that's my fault. 
that was my decision to re-traumatize myself. I want y'all to know that when you do that, it's your choice to hurt yourself. It's literally like taking a lighter and just holding it up to your whatever part of your skin. Like, do you want to hurt today? Here, let's hurt today. And that's what I did to myself for months. Now, <laughs> <laughs> my stocking is very minimal. I probably look at his stuff maybe once a month. Let me compare that to when things were at their worst in January 2020 when he had just freshly discarded me when he was sleeping with me and the new supply and leading us both on and triangulating us and lying to us and I was basically on a deathbed of pain and agony to which I cannot explain or articulate. I was probably stalking him about 10 times an hour, which during my waking hours is probably about 160 times a day. I was stalking him or her. When people say like, you still look at his stuff, I'm like once a month, <laughs> like once a month, y'all. I don't think anyone understands how addicted and obsessed a person I was with him and his new supply in the 2020. This was before the woman he's with now, by the way. He's There was other in between too. So there was a lot of stalking going on. But over the year, cause I just had this conversation with my partner. We're actually, we're not together anymore. We, we did break up just about a month and a half ago or so. But I just had this conversation with him cause he was like, you still look at his stuff and you know, if that bothers him. And I'm like, you just don't understand how much less I look at it. <laughs> I went from like, extreme stalking trauma bonded behavior to what's curiosity now. And there are some things that hurt my feelings now and then, but honestly, y'all, I've met this woman now. We've probably met three times. I invited her and her daughter to my daughter's birthday party. She was there. My ex's parents were there. Obviously we co-parent, so he was at my daughter's birthday party. So <laughs> it's, I've worked very hard to keep no bad blood, you know. This is him texting me. It's almost like he knows I'm talking about him. <laughs> just asking me how our daughter did at school today. Let me just tell him. Okay. After he basically dug his nails in and went very public, things that were happening were still hurting me, but I was really trying to hide. One, I didn't want my partner to know that I was still feeling pretty hurt about different things and about what I was seeing. So I talked to him about some of it, but not all of it. I did talk to my counselor quite a bit. I've still been in therapy on and off this whole time. We've been in touch via telehealth. I have never stopped communicating with other people and gaining support. So about November or December, there were different things happening that I realized were really hurting me surrounding the holidays and around our communication in general he seemed to become more flighty and by flighty I just mean he would just not remember things that we talked about not remember commitments we made not remember things about co-parenting and those kind of things I know are tense in any relationship any relationship any divorced couple co-parenting those kind of things can be really tense but what I found is that my ability to emotionally regulate was still incredibly difficult so hard interactions would really hurt me and there were times where the ways that he treated me after he got with his new girlfriend were just so so disrespectful it was giving so much different energy y'all than the energy he was giving me when i love you you're the only woman i ever loved and all of that stuff which was just lies and it would harm me so much it, it would yeah it would still harm me <laughs> it's yeah it would harm me it was hard. <laughs> That's what I'll say. It was very hard. And I'm saying it was because now I'm at a place where he'll say and do things and it'll make me sad, but it doesn't impact an entire day anymore. It doesn't impact an entire hour even. So for example, yesterday was our daughter's first day of school and we dropped her out together. And there were a few interactions that were bothersome. He can still be verbally abusive in very, very subtle ways. I think if he saw this, he would be so angry. He'd be like, oh my God you're saying that was verbally abusive. But little behaviors, they're very subtle. And part of the problem with verbal abuse is that oftentimes verbal abusers don't know they're doing it because they don't understand the subtlety of how you can rip a person to shreds with your words, with your tone, with your interactions, how you can dehumanize a person by constantly doing things like that. That includes constantly forgetting. These are things I've talked about in my videos about verbal abuse. I do have a whole series that I did about the ins and outs of verbal abuse. If you want to see an understand what happened to me and how verbal abuse is such a subtle demon go check out those videos for sure i'm going to give you an example of a very small demeaning thing that happened yesterday that still bothered 
bothered me but not like a whole lot it was just one of those things like I got in the car and I was just like I told my ex-partner because my ex-partner and I were still really good friends and he's helping me right now because I don't have a car so he took me to meet my daughter for her first day of school because it was in my custodial day my ex abusive husband was there I said do you want me to get a picture so I had gotten pictures with me and our daughter and I was like do you want me to get a picture with you and her and he was like no that is such a small thing okay I understand and I do not want to hear a single person comment like you're too sensitive <laughs> I'm very sensitive about people calling me sensitive <laughs> but anyway what's communicated when someone does that to you in a lot of different ways in almost every interaction what's communicated to you is why would you think I would want that you're so stupid for thinking I would want that this is ridiculous there's just a lot of ways that you can communicate that to someone over and over and over again if he did that once every six months whatever you know that's kind of like with me and my partner or even me and my best friends or even me and family members occasionally things like that happen where you have this moment where you say something to somebody and you're like like yo like you're my sister or you're my friend or you're my boyfriend or whatever like why would you say that to me like there why would you use that tone and then y'all just work it out because it happens once every six months but when someone is doing that to you 30 times a day in every interaction where they know how to use their tone their posture their voice their expressions their candor when they know how to use that to mean people they use it almost all the time as a way to keep power in the relationship so it was just a very subtle thing he did that reminded me like he's so interested in keeping power in this relationship and making me feel dehumanized probably in ways he that are happening subconsciously that he doesn't even understand and i'm so over it <laughs> So yeah, that's a small example, but it's also a great example in terms of where I am now because something like that maybe eight months ago or nine months ago did, in fact, when he would do that two, three, four, five, ten times in a day if we were interacting or texting about our daughter, I would just feel really sad. Yesterday I was just like, he's a dick. Like he is a dick. <laughs> That and some other things that happened just during the d morning drop off. I'm not even gonna go into all of it. I'm not even gonna go into all of it, but a number of things. I can say that a year out, I'm in a much different place mentally. I'm so much better off. It's so much easier for me to live. Can't really express how difficult it was for me to just be alive on this day two years ago. have been reading this book about how to survive narcissistic abuse with someone who has NPD, which is a very, it's a very specific level of, of torment in hell in an intimate partner situation. As a result, I've mentioned before that I have very, very much struggled with trauma bonding, which is basically what happens when the victim in the relationship basically becomes addicted to the abuse cycles and to the abuser. It is way more potent and powerful than you would ever imagine. I've never experienced anything like it. I read something last night. I, I had been telling my friends I feel like I'm on crack, which I've never been on crack or any drug, but I can only imagine that it would produce the kind of things that have happened in me in the last two and a half years, I would say, was when I really recognized like, I have straight up Stockholm Syndrome. I haven't done a whole lot of research about how they're different, but whatever you wanna call it, I had it. I developed it. It was January, 2017 when I realized that I had Stockholm Syndrome. Basically, the most horrible, horrible things that ever could happen in an intimate partner relationship were happening right abuse betrayal everything you can imagine degradation humiliation and i was like i'm gonna just give you an example of what stockholm syndrome looks like i was laying in bed thrashing and crying like i can't live without this i can't live without it. i will not be without my husband even though i was experiencing horrors okay and then somebody's like you need help grace this is january 2017 like something's happening in you okay so it's taken me two and a half years all since then to get out of this scenario a lot of it a lot of it was financial but a healthy part of it was trauma bonding i thought last week when our living situation changed it my trauma bonds would fall off i was mistaken I was deeply, desperately mistaken because that's just not how shit works. And I have been praying and interceding and doing lots of things to address trauma bonds because I've realized for five or six months, I'm addicted like a heroin addict. Like this is not on fleek. Once I can talk super publicly about this, I doubt I'll ever shut up. This last week when the living situation changed, it hit me like one of my children died past five to seven days. I have been devastated. It took me off guard how difficult that was. I felt like I was being 
being abandoned and murdered and having my limbs severed. And that's when I started reading this book, like how to survive narcissistic abuse with NPD, by the way, narcissistic personality disorder. I started reading about women in situations and there's lots of stories about other women who go back seven to 14 times, even women who go back and end up being murdered because of trauma bonding. And I realized I have to address this trauma bonding or it will might it might kill me if he doesn't i will kill myself there's a lot of women who go through npd in relationships end up getting all sorts of autoimmune disease and adrenal failure and one one of my friends is going through this right now because you're in such toxic stress for such a long time and i've been in toxic stress toxic stress since like december 2016 it has not stopped so the fact that i'm having panic attacks where i feel like i'm having a heart attack like that's a sign and my body is like you got to get out of here or it's gonna kill you which is why you know this year i like kicked into gear like i'm gonna survive no matter what i'm gonna get out of here because <laughs> i can't let this kill me or him when i found out some really more devastating news of basically just another betrayal i was really like I can't live like this anymore. <laughs> Even with him gone, I'm in a state. Besides like having PTSD, I'm triggered so easily now. I decided like something has to change in me right now. That was probably the most intense pain that from that day until January, 2020 that I've ever been in my life. Narcissistic abuse is one of the most horrendous things that I've ever been through and probably and will ever go through. From September, 2019 to September, 2020, there was a little bit of progress but the most progress was just like getting him the f out, getting us divorced, and surviving the panorama. But then from September 2020 to now, I cannot even tell y'all how much different my whole life is in terms of just being able to cope. Also just being on a regular schedule with my vitamin Z, with my Zoloft, having rituals of journaling, having rituals of, you know, going on walks, of meditating, of really seeking healing, of reading, of bettering myself, of starting a business to try to help other women who are going through this, to starting my YouTube channel, to believing in myself, to focusing on my kids, to focusing on my happiness, to focusing on my relationship. I put a lot of effort into my relationship, even though we broke up. It's probably almost two months ago now because we broke up in, in late June. We learned so much from each other, had so much fun. <laughs> We had such a fun, like really, really fun relationship. I promised him I would never talk about our relationship and what happened on YouTube or whatever. He's a great guy. He's a really, really good guy. And the reasons we broke up are private, but it doesn't have anything to do with him being bad to me. There's just reasons. I focused a lot on that. And I think that was also really good for me. And I even mentioned, I told this to my therapist, like we had a whole lot of sex. <laughs> like a whole lot of a whole lot of sex a whole lot of good sex i told my therapist is, that it was really healing he said oh healing because we were like you know we still do we still do these kind of meetings because of the, the panorama and he was like healing and i was like yeah it was healing because for those of you who watched the story my ex-husband telling me that i wasn't sexually attracted to him and sexually attractive to him and that i wasn't shit basically and that i was like the shit on his shoe and just that i he had no desire to have sex with me and didn't pursue sex with me and use sex as a weapon. I was coming off of that time very wounded about my sexuality. Very, very, very wounded and very uncertain and very horny <laughs> as well. Still sexually peaking and I think that having a healing sexual relationship was really good for me. Just really, really, really good for me. We just had a very healing sexual relationship. That's all I can say. It just was healing. I just feel healed as a result of being, being in that relationship with my ex-boyfriend and I'm really thankful and I told him that too I told him that like a week ago like I'm so thankful we had all the sex we had because like it's been great <laughs> so yeah that was good I think focusing on other people and helping other people is a key way that I've felt so much better I've always focused on gratitude but not giving up my gratitude practices if you're watching this and you're someone who's saying is there hope after narcissistic abuse because you're just you're so because it's like being lost at sea I understand the feeling sis I understand the feeling of feeling like you're literally out in the middle of the ocean you're screaming that you're drowning and nobody gives a
like a cruise ship is going by and they're like, hey, I wonder if that girl is really in pain. I wonder if she's really drowning. I hope she's okay. Look like she got a little raft. Look like she got a little piece of wood from, you know, the door in Titanic. She's, she'll be all right. I just know that feeling of trying to tell people like, I'm literally dying. I'm literally dying. And then just being like, but is he hitting you though? And just not being able to articulate what it's like to be dehumanized. I feel like I'm about to start crying right now. It's so intense to feel that way, to feel so helpless. So I just want you to know, for those of you who you feel like there's no hope, I do want you to know there is hope. There really is hope. I mean, I'm two years out from him moving out of the house. He moved out of the house September 1st, 2019. Today's September 7th, 2021. Is it? That's a lie. It's September 8th, 2021. And there is hope. I do feel alive. I feel like I can breathe again. I feel like I can love again. I can trust again. I feel like I trust myself. I feel like I love myself. I feel like I committed to invest in myself. And I want to tell y'all the number one way that you can do that is by focusing on yourself and not him anymore. And I know that's so hard because you want to create a spreadsheet of how he narcissistically abused you, how it works what happened who said what when where you want to show everyone the puzzle like here is the puzzle I've solved the puzzle and we spend years trying to put the pieces together of what happened to us because no one will believe us <laughs> that it's as bad as we say so we're like but here's the puzzle let me show you with my spreadsheet my excel spreadsheet what happened to me and they're still like but did he hit you though i mean because if he hasn't hit you then it's probably not so bad okay and you're like bitch and then you calm down because you realize if you start doing shit like that people will think you're crazy <laughs> <laughs> you're towing this line and I think I'm just wanting y'all to know if you focus on the spreadsheet and trying to explain to everybody and trying to solve the puzzle it really does just keep you from focusing on what you need to do so that you can heal internally because the truth is and I learned this from Melanie Tanya Evans here's what Melanie Tanya Evans has taught me because I watch her stuff watch Dr. Romney y'all watch Melanie Tanya Evans y'all watch Lisa Romano watch these women I'm sure there's other ones out there too I'm trying to be the one who's here for black women okay because those women ain't here for black women i'm here for black women so they are my predecessors i think all these women would say that including melanie tanya evans who's the one i heard it from what she says which is such a hard truth it's such a hard truth and this is said with so much love but what she says is that if you really truly deal with what's going on in you that creates the wounding when you're narcissistically abused they can't keep hurting you outside of literally murdering you and your children which you know so people can hurt you yes there's a way they can hurt you but the, the deep emotional pain that narcissistic abuse causes is because the abuser knows how to nitpick at your specific childhood woundings that are the most intense and exploit it against you which is what my ex did for example about the sexuality thing he completely exploited that against me for those of you who don't know I'm a survivor of childhood sexual abuse my father essentially raped me for the first 10 years of my life I don't even like calling it molestation because that sounds so neat and pretty like no this just raped me for like 10 years that created created a very deep, deep, deep ass wound in my life, as you can surmise. So for him to weaponize sex against me in our marriage, he exploited the out of that dynamic to the point that it felt like it was going to kill me if I could not get sex with him. And he was just like, mm -mm, you ain't getting this because I have all the power. You know, but when Melanie, when I really understood what Melanie was trying to say, she was trying to say like, if we were friends, <laughs> If we had a personal coaching relationship, which we didn't because I didn't hire her, but if I had the money, I would have. What she would have said to me is, Grace, the reason why this still hurts you is because you have not explored that deep childhood wounding and healed from it. If you had, he would not be able to exploit it. And it's such a hard truth because I don't think we want to hear our complicitness in our own pain, especially while we're in it. And that's why when I do coaching, because I do trauma-informed coaching for women who are in this situation. So if you need that, Go to my website, www.outheretryingtosurvive.com and book a discovery call. If I can help you, I would love to. At this time, I am only taking black women because that is where my heart at and that's what I want to do and that's my business. But there are so many other options if you are not a black woman.
But what I would say to women, depending on where they're at in their journey is, yes, you are complicit in it. And I am complicit in allowing myself to be loved bombed by a man because I had not explored my own deep inner child woundings. And it's rough. It's rough to admit that. It's rough to face that. And it's why I know now that I'll never be in another narcissistically abusive relationship because I've learned too much and I know too much and I've explored too much. And I've healed from too much to even begin to think that I would ignore red flags. So it's been a good year. It's been a good year. Him and his girlfriend have broken up a few times in this past year, and when they've been broken up, he's been real snotty, real shitty, had a real big attitude problem. A few times, I actually helped them to get back together. <laughs> I helped him to tell her what to say and what to do to get back together because I realized he was nicer to me and nicer to our daughter when he's with her. And I realized he was super snotty when they're not together. And that's sad, but I, I like him when he's happier. When he's happier, he's nicer. <laughs> Should I be doing that, y'all? No, it's is it unhealthy? fucked up yes you know i'm not here to be perfect i'm here just to share with y'all my journey for being a year out from being hovered i don't really think anything i do at this point is abnormal or an anomaly or super unhealthy i think it's just a woman literally out here trying to survive i am literally out here trying to survive so i don't judge myself for how i've handled this situation because i know how severe the trauma was that i was in even though other people don't understand it even though i don't have a lot of people who were willing to really stand by me the way i needed who have not been narcissistically abused themselves so you can tell I still have some wounding because I bring that up a lot. So I, I, I can see that I still have some woundings with that dynamic. I'm committed to working on it, but I'm just, I'm so happy. I'm so much happier than I was this time last year. And I'm so much, so much happier. I mean, God, the year before that traumatized. But I can't even imagine where I'm going to be September 8th, 2022. What I can tell y'all when I come back and do another two years update post narcissistic abuse hover, I cannot even imagine how much better things are going to be because I've continued to pursue my healing and gratitude and meditation and journaling and lists and hope and healing and healthy relationships and healthy partnerships and growing my business and helping other women and continuing to focus on my kids and focus on YouTube and focus on my health and eating better and working out and taking care of myself. Everything from my hair <laughs> to my toenails. I want to invest in a total mind, body, spirit journey of healing. That is how you get through any trauma, narcissistic abuse or not. But nar narcissistic abuse is the one form of abuse that wants to keep you entangled in the trauma of it and keep you focused on the trauma of it, which is why I think it can be worse than other forms of trauma because other forms of trauma are not as committed to keeping you stuck. I think that's all for now. Thank you so much for watching.